We're going to continue our study in the Westminster Larger Catechism. We're looking at question number 26. Here the Westminster divines ask in question number 26, how is original sin conveyed from our first parents unto their posterity? And the divines answered, original sin is conveyed from our first parents unto their posterity by natural generation. So as all that proceed from them in that way are conceived and born in sin. Now, as we come to question number 26, we turn our attention, of course, again, back to that issue of original sin and how it has affected the human race. Now, this is a very important doctrine. It's on the very nature of sin itself. It's on the nature of how it has been conveyed to us, and eventually it's going to lead us to see because of the very essence of its conveyance and how that it places one in bondage, there comes a need of necessity for redemption to be something outside of man, not from within. Sin turns man against God. So we have this important doctrine of original sin, that all men are born in sin. We've seen that in Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We see it also written in Job 15, 14. What is man that he could be pure, and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? We are not born righteous. We are born of woman, and from that natural generation, we are therefore conceived and born into sin. And in John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, the doctrine of original sin is based on the fact that Adam was, of course, the first man who was created. And with his wife, Eve, all mankind as their posterity who are our ancestors, have fallen into the same condemnation of the transgression they took in the garden. We've spoken quite a bit about that. Now, this is referred to as natural relationship. That is to say, we have a natural relationship to Adam and Eve because they are the first couple. They are our ancestors. If you will, if you want to extend it through how many generations it would be, after all these years, they are, in essence, your grandparents. They are the foundation for all living men and women. So that is the first relationship that they have and that we have with them. It is a natural relationship. We come from them, generation after generation after generation. The second relationship that we need to consider is based on the principle that Adam was our federal covenant head. And in the covenant of life that God had given to him in the garden, his actions is representative of all his posterity. This representation as federal head conveyed the forensic violation of God's law upon every one of his children. And they are considered guilty of the trespass, even though they did not sin in the same way that Adam sinned. Nevertheless, they are held accountable for his transgression. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5, 12 through 15. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, referring to Adam, the first Adam, and death through sin, that's the result. And thus death spread where? To all men. All men are affected by the consequence of Adam's first transgression. Because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned 
from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him, Christ, who is to come. Now, the guilt of Adam's transgression in the garden has clearly been imputed to all of his posterity, all except for Christ. This first sin, as we noted, was forensic. That means it's legal. It's a judicial sin. And the penalty is judicial for the violation of the covenant of life or works that God had placed him in, in the garden. The ultimate effect was moral and physical death. The penalty was immediate to Adam in his morality and physical nature. He both fell dead spiritually in his relationship to God. He becomes, as you were, an enemy of God. He's a transgressor, a violator of the commandment of God. And he physically begins to die. He cannot stop that process. As a matter of fact, the process is never reversed. Even in redemption, the reminder of death is the result of the original transgression. But the promise to us who believe is a resurrection of life. That is, back from the dead bodily. It is on this basis of this first sin and its forensic nature thereof, in which all men are born into this world. They are born with the guilt of Adam's original sin, and it is reckoned or imputed as it is reckoned or imputed to him. The Holy Spirit having been withdrawn, Adam is said to be both morally and physically dead, as well as his future generations. The sinful nature is not transmitted, though, by mechanisms of biological heredity or physical characteristics from generation to generation. That's not what we mean. Sin is a spiritual fact, not a bodily property or characteristic. If original sin were transmitted from parent to child by biological hered uh, heredity, we would receive it from our immediate parents rather than our first parents. If it was biological in nature, then our children would be regenerated at conception if the parents were Christians. It simply cannot be. That is not the case of salvation. So we're not talking about a biological or mechanistic type of transmission. It is a state in which Adam has been condemned and all of his children will be born under that condemnation with a conscience that recognizes its guilt and that he is an enemy of God. And judgment is about to be served upon him unless he can escape such judgment which cannot come from within, but such only through the revelation of God where he specially reveals that redemption comes through his provision, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, for salvation. Well, let me simply say in conclusion, man has no choice in the matter of his sinful state. He's born into it. It's already been decided. Adam fell in the garden. He is the transgressor. It is from him, an original sin, that we are made sinners. Conceived in iniquity, we are born into this world, into the bondage of sin. It was decided for us in the garden when our first ancestors transgressed the commandment of God not to eat. From thence forth, man has been at enmity with God. Listen to Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Or James 4.4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. And in Ephesians 2.16, 
wherein Paul writes, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby what? Putting to death the enmity. (coughs) The enmity between God and man. Man is under the bondage of original sin. It needs to be freed from its effect upon his life, but he cannot escape the bondage to which he was born into through acts of his own volition, through his own determination, through an act of his will, as it were. He can only be saved through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, whereby faith is given to him that he might believe the promises of redemption in the Christ of the Scripture alone. That's the basis of his salvation. It is not how great I are, but how great God is in saving us. Let us not forget how much we are so dependent upon, how much we owe in gratitude and honor unto our sovereign God and to his Son who hath saved us through his death upon the cross. Thank you.